Okay. Hello. We are live. Oh, I guess I, I didn't. I wasn't really uh, paying attention to the music it was supposed to be playing. So welcome, welcome to the uh, Naruto's Nerdy Power. I'm back from Japan. I think Nathan covered me while I was in Japan. Maybe did you? Yeah, no, we actually didn't have a nerd. Nerdy oh, Power. Okay, or okay. We did Japanese yes. Knife One Hundred One, and in your honor, we ate some Japanese snacks. Oh yeah, yeah. And with, with the some uh, Korean and Chinese mixed in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I okay. thought I bought everything Japanese, and then I checked the lettering, and I was like, oh, that's not Japanese. That's okay. That's okay. I wasn't here, right? Yeah. I wasn't here. I was in Japan. For oh. those of you uh, who may not know, um, we, Naifura, Mike, and I just um, went to Japan and came back about a week ago. We were there for two weeks. We did actually uh, some live videos while we were in Japan as well. For those of you who may have actually watched it, it's still on the um, uh, YouTube uh, channel. We were at the uh, Massage Sons workshop, and we actually did the uh, live show from there. So if you're interested, go back and watch it. It is a full episode, but it was, I think it was pretty cool. We did the, uh, we did have the camera going into his uh, uh, hammers and, you know, like while he was hammering and all that stuff. So it was pretty cool to watch. Also, we've got a lot of great footages for a uh, you know future um, future this channel knife or uh, YouTube. So uh, hopefully we'll see lots coming pretty soon as well. Okay, um, today it's probably the first well prelude to the a uh, our you know knife or garage sale extravaganza i guess right the uh, i think it's, yeah, it's coming great. up quick the um, garage sale is all knife or garage sales quite a bit different from any other garage sales that you may find um i think a lot of you watching uh probably knows the idea about it but the, it is quite a bit different knife or garage sale it's not ordinary garage sale so our garage sale is all about something super unique, one of a kind. There are quite a few items that are, you know, good, very, very well priced. But also we have very special pieces that kind of like some pieces that we actually found, even some in Japan as well. So we'll uh, we'll start that in the uh, on May 16th, the Monday on 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Mountain time. 8 a.m. Yeah. Mountain Standard Time. Standard, yeah. yes. And it starts, they, they like starts 10, 10 a.m. local time. Yes. So yeah. the um, today this uh, this uh, one is going to be a uh, first one since that the uh, start of pandemic. So we'll have we will yeah. we will not have any. Uh, I don't think we'll have any restrictions. Yeah, we'll definitely have um, you know full stock in stores and, um, mm. and you know just all the kind of buzz and excitement and mm -hmm. the, the rummage sale uh, quality that the yeah. garage sale once had. So if you're if you're here, uh, you know if you live in any of those cities that we have stores in, go go take a visit. If you uh, and if you don't feel comfortable and safe, there's lots and tons available online as well. So do not worry too much about that either. Yeah, although, I mean, there'll be mostly the same stock online, some probably online exclusive stuff, right? <laughs> and uh, and the stores, uh, their stock, if you're worried about going into the store, their stock won't go online until the second day. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're going to the store, you don't have to be there right and opening. Mm -hmm. Obviously, some fun stuff goes right away, but mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the uh, thing about, um, also, one of the thing about our uh, May um, May and the uh, November grass sale is the uh, we do refurbish some knives and the uh, sell at very very good price. It has been mm. it has been very very good price. And um, last probably five, I am the uh, I'm responsible on um, preparing and making sure the uh, these knives look good and such. So I kind of today the uh, nerdy power hour. As much as I would like to talk more about the what really happened in Japan, let's just keep it until the uh, you know a lot of videos coming out, and also we have the uh, Sharp Knife Rock mm -hmm. um, episode, Garasso episode, pretty soon as well. So let's keep that until then. Or yeah, yeah, we'll definitely talk about the Japan yeah. trip. We've already got one question about it mm -hmm. in the chat. So uh, yeah, well, I mean, like, yeah. put the questions in. Let's do let's do that. Put the questions in, yeah. and if you have any. If you have a uh, time to answer, yeah. we'll definitely do that. 
let's let's what are we doing today? Let's yeah. let's get into that. Just today, um, got the this Sunahisa. This is kind of um weird knife. The uh, one of the uh, one section of the knife uh, keeps chipping it. This is this may be the faulty. It may be um, the uh, mistreat mistreatment, the heat treatment. But I was gonna actually give it a try and see. That is that is the thing. Um, so I started sharpening on the bevel here. There is a small tiny chip on here. Um, I did um, make sure that the knife is straight. So if you actually see the back, Uraoshi has been done. Um, Uraoshi is the, uh, put this back of the single bevel knife very flat and make sure that the knife is all straight. Um, so I've done that the little bit of Uraoshi part here. So you can see the very shiny, about, about a millimeter uh, from the edge all the way to here. Hopefully you'll see that there. And I started working on the front side. Um, I do though have the small chip left on the uh, little tip right here. So uh, what I'm gonna do is just gonna remove that really quick. The uh, first one I'm gonna use is the, uh, this is the uh, Shafton Glass 220 grit. Wow, you use that thing, hey? <laughs> Looks a bit different than it does when it's brand new. Yeah. It still has like few, you know. I, I had a question before, you know, if you guys have questions, pop them in the comments, but I had a question about uh, those Shafton Glass stones. Mm -hmm. how, how are they and how quickly do they wear? Because they are, like, especially the 220, it's pretty thin compared to the regular. The uh, 220 is definitely softer okay. compared to some other stones like a uh, one that like it's the same series as well like this is pretty soft it uh, it wears down a little bit faster than the uh, others and i do also you know keep them flat as much as possible too so that the uh, you know you wear that down as well that way gotcha but the um What are you doing there? Are you just removing the uh, little bit of bevel? burr off the? And that's just to get that chip out of there and then move on. And that's my hope. Okay. All right. So. So for those of you just tuning in, we've got uh, Naoto is re uh, we're doing some knife restoration today. Um, one of the big things that Naoto does <laughs> at work, in addition to everything he does in Japan. But uh, we have uh, generally a bunch of refurbished knives that end up in the spring and fall garage sale. And with the spring garage sale coming up in a few weeks, uh, Naoto's got a handful of knives to refurbish. So we, we do some on live stream this month. Yes. So this the uh, Tsunehisa Yanagiba, sharp, uh, forged by the uh, sharpened by Akira Sasaoka-san in uh, Kochi. Yeah. Uh, there was a small chip on the edge, so I'm going to remove that at the very big angle. Okay. And, and the higher angle just helps you get rid of that chip really quickly. It's faster, right? yeah. Well, while you're working on that, um, we got a few people tuning in. Spoon Monkey says, hey, everybody, uh, just tuned in. Welcome, everybody, to the live stream today. Uh, we did have a question from uh, Adrian Giovanni on Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of questions. First, uh, uh, how was your trip to Japan? <laughs> Said, I know it's not the topic for today, but... Uh, no, it should be. It should I, be covered. I think, I think that's what we're talking it about. It should be since, covered. So, since it's super exciting. Yeah, the... Um... Travel restrictions still are up uh, to Japan. Like if you're trying to go to Japan as a, a tourist, um, tourists um, they're not not open yet for any uh, tourist uh, tourists um, from abroad. Uh, they're only allowing the uh, people um, foreign nationals for uh, business purposes. 
as well as the uh, uh, study purposes. So uh, lots of international students are going back to uh, Japan. Um, we're fortunate enough that our partner in Japan um, could help us out getting us a, uh, some paperwork and stuff. So uh, we, um, we, that was like first thing. Yeah, we're they, very lucky. They, they reopened. Uh, oh. The infection numbers are down um, and thought it's it's good time to say hi. And of course, you know, with the, uh, the safest manner possible too, right? The, uh, for us and for them. The, uh, for us, of course, like if you, uh, Japanese, the uh, close contact rules are so much more, um, so much more strict than the probably most countries uh, that you are tuning in from. The, uh, um, when, we were, when we are in Japan, if you're identified as the close contact of the, uh, uh, of the COVID-19 uh, infection, even the close contact, you'd have to uh, self-isolate for like a couple of days or three or four days oh, wow. and think up to five days. And we have to be very careful because, you know, you're on a business trip, but you're traveling quite a bit, you know, to see different people, right? Yep. So uh, I brought the uh, rapid testing kits and tested every two to three days. <laughs> <laughs> make That's sure. good. Yeah. So just. Oh, we don't want to make any of our knife sharpers. Exactly, <laughs> right? And uh, for those people who are not still comfortable, you know, meeting or accepting the uh, people from outside, we're like, sure, you know. We feel that, so we, we didn't go visit, right? Mm -hmm. Only for those people who are like, yes, please, you know, we like to come see you, right? So, yeah. uh, but we, we got to actually meet lots of different people uh, in a uh, more concentrated area of Japan, um, namely Tsubame and the Sanjo area, as well as the uh, Osaka Sakai. So it was actually a really good, uh, good trip. Mm. Yeah, it looked really cool. I was very jealous. <laughs> You guys had a lot of, uh, ate a lot of good food. So I, I, it sounds like it was also a very busy uh, it, trip. Like yeah. you guys were running around the whole time. Yep. The, um, you know, you have to make the most out of it, right? So uh, <laughs> there was even a night uh, that the we took a uh, overnight bus in Japan. Oh, yeah. So we did, we did go to the little public onsen uh, bath before we, you know, get on the, uh, get on that, the, the bus ride. Oh my God, kind of really? cool. Yeah. <laughs> like 20 minute quick, you know, Hope, bath. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully that would help you at least like nap a little bit on the bus maybe. Yeah. And I also, I did, yeah, I did. I did. I didn't want to feel gross. Like, cause one yeah. of the good thing about taking that, I don't, I don't recommend it, but good, really good thing about taking the overnight bus is that the, uh, you know, next day you're up. Mm -hmm. And you can just go straight to work. Right. Without, you know, so. Um, yeah, no kidding. But we did. But we didn't want to feel, you know, gross to that those like, people who we were going to meet. So uh, we decided to take, you know, like shower and bath before we get on that. The, uh, That's a good idea. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's respectful. And we didn't want to feel gross either. No, no kidding. So, again, I'm working on the bevel side, because I re did remove quite a bit of steel at the tip, um, I need quite a bit of uh, time to thin. That's why I use the, uh, this 220 stone. Mm. Oh, Pop, a couple more questions in there. Mm -hmm. I know this is the, the heavy lifting part of the episode. Yeah, so sure. we always get time for questions, especially early on. Uh, Adrian Giovanni at the very top of the episode asked, uh, any Denkas in the garage sale? I didn't, unfortunately, did not get, get to meet a uh, Fujiro-san at this trip. Mm. And the, um, so like usually Fujiro-san, we, we, like there is that the regular line and sometimes different, uh, you know, slight different handles that, you know, he only carries in, uh, in at the, Jap the shop in Japan, right? Right. And that we sometimes, you know, grab them. But um, there is like, you know, Wa handle Denka and the regular Western handle Denka always available. Yep. So, um, you know, but uh, yeah, not, not so much like the uh, super special. Maybe next time the uh, when Kevin is finally going to see uh, Fujara-san in like four or five years. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> right? Because, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess like when's the last time anybody went to see Fujara-san? It's like been a very long time, right? Right, yeah. So. 
it may be the last maybe when i went to uh see fujara san with the uh, visti the uh photographer oh for the book yeah 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 and i think that was the last time so that's the uh the nightmare's guide to japanese knives if anybody uh hasn't checked out the book that kevin wrote uh kevin and Nacho wrote uh no it's kevin's book <laughs> you, you did Thank a part you. of it Thank um you. but yeah it's, it's it's pretty cool it's got a lot of stories about the, the make the, the folks who make our knives kind of straight from the horse's mouth as it were you know from all the stuff we've learned on our trips there so we, we had a, a a good question on the episode a while ago just saying um you know, because there's some, I think, particular because there's some counterfeit knives out there mm. sometimes saying, I think it was with you, Chris Aki, saying, hey, like, you know, how do you know for sure that you're getting his knives, that kind of thing. Mm. It's like, well, because we, because <laughs> we go there and talk to him and, mm. and he's, he told us it's his knife. So I'm pretty lucky to be able to do that. Um, okay. Uh, good question from Spoon Monkey here. Mm -hmm. On the last episode of Japanese Knife 101, the Japanese junk food edition. Mm -hmm. uh, Spoon Monkey asked about Japanese chocolates, which uh, Lordy and I weren't really re prepared to talk about. And he said, uh, none of the snacks we ate were chocolate based, which is correct. So, um, you know, what what is Japanese chocolate like? Does it compare to stuff here? Or is it not a big thing in Japan? Um, chocolate is a big thing. The um, There are quite a few companies makes the... Uh, you know, very inexpensive type of chocolate, um, as well as the um, super expensive ones. If you actually look at the uh, some of the most expensive um, chocolate shops in the world, like the uh, you know ones in the Netherlands or ones in the France, mm. often they do have the shop in Japan and Tokyo as well. Oh. So the uh, so Tokyo has very rich in Japan, like as a whole, has very rich culture in those. Uh, western um i guess um food i guess and uh you know cuisine mm -hmm. um one of the best pastry chefs are from japan and they always like at the one of the tops in the uh, international competitions yeah. chocolatiers uh they are usually going to the competitions as well and usually japanese once japanese comes quite quite as close to the top sometimes wins that the competition itself oh wow so um <clears throat> So those are the people who does the fancy side of chocolate, right? Right. Um, where there is like still the snacks. Um, Meiji, for example, the company uh, does lots of uh, chocolate confectionaries and stuff. Uh, they do so very inexpensive, uh, just bar of chocolate and stuff like that. They're pretty good. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Japan, chocolate is a good thing in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris and I just suck at finding it. <laughs> it's, it yeah, it's, it is. It is. It is a huge. Uh, oh, huge thing pastries um croissant uh bakeries lots of famed uh french and the uh i think it's big in netherlands right dutch yeah. um those uh, chefs like to open at the place in tokyo um joe roshan the mm -hmm. uh that guy who has the most michelin stars mm -hmm. in the world he has the not only a restaurant in tokyo but he has a bakery uh, under his name in tokyo as well oh, cool. joe rob yeah Good. all right tell us about this knife now so where are we at so it's gonna take quite a while <laughs> it's gonna take a while cool. we have time for lots of questions yeah so i i don't know how um how much we are actually going to <laughs> uh where are we gonna actually go with this one? I may just gonna, you know, time goes. I don't. I may not have the enough time to do a yeah. next step. But so we can do. Yeah. We can we can drop some restoration knowledge in there again because you know again this episode right. is kind of about trips and ticks, trips. Jesus, I tips and it. tips and tricks. Yeah. Thank so you. when you're restore, try to restore the knife like this one here. It's got a little chip on it. It had a little bit of uh, rust on that stuff. Um, First thing I would do is to remove all the rust and uh, clean it up. Second is really to make sure this is the uh, this knife is the optimal condition to be, I guess, restored, like mm. straightness. And that's really important, especially when you're trying to uh, do the back uraoshi. You want to make sure that the back of the uh, ura is nice and straight and it's got a nice uh, com uh, cavity mm. in the middle as well. Yeah, you pretty almost always straighten the knife or check the straightness of the knife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, third, um, I guess the uh, especially the single bevel 
bevel knife like these guys make sure there is no like deep rust on the back of the mm. knife front of the knife is fine because it is clad with uh, usually clad with the different type of steel on top the back though the uh, because it's just one this one piece steel it is uh, often if you find that the really deep rust at the edge part uh, you'd have to remove that completely otherwise it can uh, chew into the steel right and then as you sharpen up the knife i'm guessing you'll start to run into that yeah when i'm sharpening the bevel side though i always make sure that the bevel is nice and flat um so right now it's not necessarily the best condition uh because as i'm doing this i can see that s some spots are lower than other parts so i do I do work, uh, keep working on the core stone until the, there's no low spots on that uh, this knife, which I realized I do need the uh, chewing stone. <laughs> uh, did we uh, give that one away to Mike? Yeah. Okay, I'll grab one for you. Thank you. So while he's uh, he's trying to get the chewing stone for me, just gonna work a little bit more. Okay. Thank you. Here we go. Okay, well, thanks for the tips, Noto. You got time for a few more questions? Sure. Now? We got some great viewer questions that are coming in. Thanks, guys. Um, so, Daddy Knows Best is asking, what grit gets you a mirror? I use 1,200, or sorry, 12,000, and it's almost there, but I can spend more time on it. And we actually did a, a video about this recently on the channel, so it's a good topic to talk about. The, um, in order to get the real mirror polish is quite um, quite a bit of challenge especially with just using those stones lots of people do use the uh so if you go to japan uh, and see one of the knife makers uh what they use is actually the uh, not the stones but the whole bunch of belts and the uh, buffing wheels and buffing wheels are the tools to finish that the last bit of, uh, um, you know, making it the extra mirror, right? Buffing wheels with the uh, little bit of a chromium oxide or aluminum oxide or just, you know, buff, buffing wheel by itself. Um, if you're trying to make it a mirror polish, few things that you want to uh, keep that in mind. Yes, the 12,000 grit stone will get you, especially the edge part will get as close to the mirror. And you could definitely try to do a 30,000 grit. Although the uh, 30,000 grit stone, um, you want to make sure that the surface that you are uh, sharpening is dead flat. Mm. Otherwise, it's the uh, tiny bit of convexity or the unevenness will show on that the mirror polish if that 30,000 grit stone is very hard. Uh, what you could do, and, I, and what I have seen before, is the uh, use the different variation of the uh, one wet sandpaper, put it uh, put the uh, knife under the tap water, run the tap water while you are polishing it. Uh, that will give you really, really nice shine to it and progress up to say 2000 grit uh, sandpaper. Then you could do a uh, something like a uh, diamond paste. Again, you know, go all the way up to uh, 10,000 grit mm. uh, or uh, even 20,000, 30,000 grit. That will get you very fine mirror polish. Lee Valley has some sharpening, there's some polishing pads there. They for turning pens, I think, mm. on a wood blade, but, uh, but can be good for that. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, they said kind of in reference to that, I did a reprofile and got a Shun uh, SG2 Hikari pretty darn sharp. Mm -hmm. Encouraged me to do better and explore, which is awesome to hear. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the wheels did definitely save you time, and also that uh, fixing a damaged SG2 was bad. But then you do is just crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no thanks. Yeah, ZDP is really really hard. It's great steel to like use in the as kitchen. as a user. Yeah. Yeah. Not fun for uh, not fun for you. Okay. How's the how's the knife? Anything to report? Is it in decent shape? No, it was not really decent shape. <laughs> That's why it's taking a little bit longer. Yeah, no kidding. Starting to see the uh, little parts. This part is a little bit lower. Um, this part is a little bit lower. The 
top part is starting to actually get a little bit more nicer, even finish. But still needs uh, quite a bit of thinning from the uh, removing the chip. Mm. Yeah, that really uh, that really tacks on a lot of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. The sharpening process. Well, that's what is the restoration, right? Yeah. Speaking of which, we got a restoration video coming out on the YouTube channel in the next, uh, either next week or the following week. Uh, we're now just going to refurbish a knife. Uh, if you watch Monday's video, that's the knife he's refurbishing. Oh yeah, the uh, the horrible thing that the mic's done to the uh, to the knife. The stress test. Yeah. Um. Okay. Question from Dhop three ten who always has the great questions. How long does it take Nauto to turn a wedging knife? into a laser like a real thinning out hot rodding job if i have the well if i'm doing it with proper i guess equipment um mm. yeah like a, a, a wheel yeah yeah and um for shaping it it won't take that long um if uh, say for example the a slight rougher finish that the fujara san puts on i could do it pretty quick like 15 to 30 minutes. The whole process. And if, yeah, that's the really just the, the how thin and razor that can be, right? Right. And the, from there, uh, polishing job takes about probably about the same or slightly more, like making, making sure there's that no deep scratches left and stuff like that. Uh, mm. I did fix the one of the Fujara Maboroshi, two of the Fujara Maboroshi the other day with the uh, uh, chip on it. So yeah. I had to remove the chip and thin out. Thankfully, the uh, um, one of the things that I uh, put into my workshop is this uh, uh, little small bell sander, mm -hmm. and that will give the really nice uh, Fujara type of uh, finish. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, kind of like the nice grinding lines. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like nice, even grinding lines yeah. was achieved pretty uh, evenly and uh, pretty, you know, easy, right? Mm -hmm. Easily. So, um, that took me a like very short period, where uh, when I was uh, trying to fix that a little bit more, uh, say Mazaki San's knife I was sharpening, though his knives are fantastic and there's no low spots, um, I did all the process by hand from the uh, thinning to mm. the uh, polishing and last edge. So it took me at least 30 to 40 minutes on that knife. Right. So uh, it really depends uh, on the condition of the knife as well as the how I'm going to approach it. Uh, one of the things that I learned, we learned, I guess, the uh, at the Mazaki-san's workshop, which was really fascinating. What sets Mazaki-san apart is his the way he sharpens or the way he sharpens his knives. Mm. After he forged the knife, a lot of people, lots of knife makers use the uh, this big grinding wheel and they do so-called aratogi to get the uh, core out. Then they do slight different um, wheel to get a little bit more out. Then some like bell sander and buffing wheels and that such to get that to finish on. Um, where Masaki-san, what he did is that he just did the very medium coarse grindstone to get the core core steel kind of exposed. Then from there, he does all the jobs by hand, like wow. on the stones. Oh. It's, a, it's a lot of work. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah. And he's a manufacturer, not the resharpener. Um, right. So, um, the, but by doing so, what, what it does is that the, when you take his uh, knives for resharpening, uh, put the knife on the bevel like this, there is no low spots whatsoever on his knife mm. because he makes sure that there's no you know, low spots. It, like all the bevel will touch on the stone. Yeah. Pretty nice and even. Yeah. And that, I mean, that way of sharpening is, uh, he's not doing it for the money. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's a sharpener. He just is purely doing it for passion and skill. Yeah. yeah. Cool. How, just to summarize, you know, that, that thinning up process, if you're doing that by hand, how long would it take, do you think? That's like... You take a not uh, chip repair, like thick knife to fill it. Uh, at least two hours, I think. 
Yeah. Depends on it. I am what I'm excited about uh, this. Hopefully, make it soon. But the uh, the shipment that we are expecting to come from the Naniwa is this a uh, diamond stone, but not the uh, this type of diamond stone. This is basically metal plate with the uh, diamond kind of uh, sprinkled mm. or goes on top of it. Where the uh, there's another type called the uh, they basically mix the diamond. Uh, paste into the as a, the abrasive and they are much easier to maintain the flatness as well because of the dime they use diamond as an abrasive at the uh it cuts steel much faster mm. so the, 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 the knife wears in the stone last time mm. and the another thing is that the um it doesn't leave as deep of a scratch as those diamond plate does right because it's not sticking up as much. exactly so I'm um, really excited to see that uh, coming and to get to kind of try them. Cool. Awesome. All right. We got any updates for the knife? Should we carry on with questions? Yes. Carry on with the questions. All right. You can ask any questions, like any questions that you have. Uh, you may, you know, like Not trip to Japan. Team. Yeah. Or a trip to Japan. You know, what's the weirdest thing that we ate yeah. while we were in Japan? If you want to know about stuff coming in from the garage show, we might be able to give you a couple of hints. A couple of hints, yeah. <laughs> you can't spill the beans yet, but you know. Um, okay, well, let's move on to the next question then. Um, if I can find it. Uh, Powell L. is asking, I bought a Kobayashi 240 Uto. Mm -hmm. Nice, congrats. Can you tell me for the future what angle to use to sharpen the knife? I have a Syrax 1000 and Rika 5000. Right. So. The uh, Kobesh says knives, uh, because the nature of the way he sharpens and creates the bevel, it's very thin. So you will not need that much of thinning until um, probably if you're just going to touch up with your um, um, just Rika uh, stones, uh, you don't have to, like, say, do a very aggressive uh, thinning. Um, and I usually sharpen probably that at the uh, – generally, 15 is what I would sharpen that knife at. Um, 15 degrees is good kind of balanced edge. If you like that knife to uh, cut it into much more – a little bit more aggressively, you can do it like 12, 10 degrees. Yeah. Um, also, think about what you are cutting, what you are um, using the knife for as well. Because if you're using it for um, uh, something that, and that's something that we, we learned as well. If you want to get the flavor of the particular food out, for example, we did the test at the Masashi's and it was very fascinating. Mm, um, so we had this really nice piece of the uh, piece of uh, prosciutto made in Niigata. You know, there's a, um, there's a the very particular um, prosciutto mania in that area. And hmm. we, he had this uh, piece, I think 36 month aged prosciutto. Like, and it was fantastic. And he had these two knives. One, he sharpened up to really fine, almost like 2000 with a wheel. And well, the other one, he had a one with the uh, about, 1,000 hand. Okay. So the flavor that you get from the 1,000 grit um, is that the uh, because it's a little bit more coarser, coarser and toothier edge, it breaks that the um, little bit more cells and takes the little flavor out. Right. Now it takes it out, like allows it to release? Release or, the okay, aroma? Yeah. It doesn't and, kill the flavor. No, no, no. Like, well, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. release the aroma and the flavor. Kind of like how you would let cheese sit out for a bit and warm up. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Mm. So it was very fascinating. And the one that's cut with a very fine, it was like almost like glassy, right? Right. It, I've had that with like, first time I cut a carrot. Yeah, 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 I yeah. was like, what? what is this? Right. <laughs> right. So, um, so that's something that you may want to consider as well. Like if you are to, so... Good thing for a, um, say, like really raw fish, um, use a very fine grit. 
It doesn't snag. It cuts very nice. And, and the very fresh fish, not aged fish, but fresh fish doesn't have that much of flavor yet to develop. Mm. So you complement with the soy sauce. And once you chew on it, that really is then texture you're、uh, enjoying it.、Mm -hmm. For example, like、um, aged tuna、mm -hmm. or the,、uh, you know, like really 28 aged、um, beef and stuff like that.、Yeah. Um, It, it really depends. But the, if you're going to eat them、uh, to the point that's like, say, carpaccio style, yeah, yeah. it may be good to cut them with the little or、um, cut them with a little bit more toothier edge. Right. Because, Japanese because use. Because it's denser and stickier. Yeah.、Around. Japanese use, though, this technique. Instead of, like, say, for example, Avalon, Japanese use this technique to move the,、uh, this. Knife, do this to make the jagged edge. Oh, that catches more soy sauce as well as release the flavor. Oh, it's fucking genius. <laughs> that's really cool. But、um, that's something that I, it's really interesting to、uh, hear, right?、Mm -hmm. And when, the, when he was talking about it, when the knife is sharp and really fine, they did that little、um, observation, I guess, with the microscope. And they looked at the, how the cell reacts、yeah. to the very fine,、uh, fine edge.、Yeah. When it's like super, super fine, because it's so thin, it tried to cut the cell, and the cell just gonna move, move along. It just gives away. Yeah. yeah. Move along. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. you're cutting in between the cells, <laughs> where if you leave it a little bit more coarser,、yeah. it cuts and releases that.、Uh, That's like, insane. So it was. I always kind of thought that, but I didn't know if there was any truth to that. It was very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome.、Uh, okay. Hope you guys are enjoying this. We're just kind of nerding out today.、Um, not really a question for me, 30 Burry, but you might be able to help.、Mm -hmm. uh, I really need to thin my Shiro Kamo Yuto. Yeah. Concave grind. Yeah. So it would take forever to get out of the low spots.、Mm. There's a couple ways you can go about doing that. Again, the,、um, like、I've, I've talked about it a few times here. Uh, low spots may not be the bad thing. It kind of does help release the food a little bit because the、uh, Yanagiba and、uh, any single bevels have the other、uh, low spots or concavity on the side as well, right?、Um, and yes, the concavity does、um, play a little bit more negative role. One,、uh, because the,、uh, it can make the、uh, knife a little bit more brittle. Because it gets a little bit more too thin around the edge as well.、Um, two is the,、uh, it often、uh, exposes a little bit more core steel than the,、uh, the convex edge. So、uh, concavity makes it again a little bit more、um, like、brittle, right? Because you are exposing the core steel more than it needs to.、Mm. Um, And there is a little bit of a, I guess, not a controversy, but one or two things about the, I guess, getting into the low spots. What I often do is to use the,、uh, those stones that we kind of finished using, right? It's a finger stone that's been used for a long time. It became very thin. So I break off and try to work that,、uh, that low spots on. But at the same time, though, the,、uh, while you're doing it,、um, I am. Grinding that low spots off or caving it in even deeper,、mm, right? right? It will not help, it will help to make the,、uh, the bevel look pretty cool, but not going to help any way to release or to mitigate that、uh, concavity. I'm actually worsening it. Yeah, right. Try a little bit less, but it still does. So, If you're the owner of the knife,、uh, thinning the knife,、uh, thinning that particular knife, I would leave it because the more you sharpen on the bevel side, it will come out.、Mm. Okay. So yeah, it is、sense. cosmetic. The, one of the reasons why we do it is that the, one of the stones that we use is quite aggressive. The first stone that we use is quite aggressive that actually leaves. Quite deep scratches on.、Mm -hmm. And when, especially when customer is sending the knife, sending the knife 
or repair or sharpening, they are not expecting that the deep scratch to be on that knife. Yeah, it's not. I mean, we like to give back an aesthetic product. Yeah. Product, especially when they start with something so pretty, we don't want to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> downgrade it, quote unquote. So, uh, really yeah. Well. So that's something that the yeah, I am very careful. Yeah. That's their concern is that uh, Ether debris says, I kind of just worry that my gray hat will look like trash for a while if I don't get them out. Mm. Yeah, I. I mean that's the, you know if you're if you're particular about the look of your knife, uh, it makes it better to just take a day, <laughs> one of your days off, and just just kind of stand in front of that stone for mm -hmm. a few hours. Um, I found like on mine, thinning out my mustard target zero by hand, it took about uh, two sharpings, mm. two thinnings to come out. Yeah, so it wasn't too bad, but that depends on the maker. Um, and Paul L, just a follow up to the new Kobayashi knife. Uh, oh, sorry, wrong, <laughs> wrong response. So thanks for the answer. Uh, as far as the sharpening angle of the Kobayashi, mm -hmm. uh, I used it today for the first time for veggies. And wow, it's a laser! I didn't even feel it when I cut an onion. Mm. My wife says that she's afraid of the blade. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and bought her a, a bunker that's also SG2, but from your student custom. Oh, yeah, that, that one's so thin, too. Yeah. yeah. The knives that I've been actually liking these days is that the... Uh, so it's like, there, there's always progression on what knife you, you know, what kind of knife you like and stuff. I think, you know, you start off from this particular knife, and then you... Now, I, I like the ones that... I don't mind a little thicker spine, mm. as long as the uh, the behind edge is really nice and thin, and it's got a nice even like nice tall bevel to it. Yeah. Or even bevel. So, um, or something that the sharpeners kind of thought of and you know tried to demonstrate on the skills. Um, one of the things. Um, that I have been talking with the uh, Mariyama san from Hado is that the uh, nice torsion sh torsion sharpening technique that has the uh, the tip of the knife much more thinner than the heel part. Heel part remains a little thicker and thinner at the tip. Um, that's what I'm trying to uh, sharpen my knives as, as, as well as try to convince the... Uh, Sharpeners do that the, the same. Yeah. And uh, as I was in uh, in Japan, I by the way I do have the their two forty knife already. Oh yeah. Like Hado Sumi. Oh. And uh, I looked at their new batch of Hado uh, Sumi two ten. Yeah. yeah. I picked it up. <laughs> and you wanted. It. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Please, when you put this one in a box, just put the tiny dot with your Sharpie. It's not going to be like, you know, I'm not determined. But when that knife comes in, I'll look at it. And I'm like, I'll ponder. I'm like, that was very nicely sharpened. It was so sexy. Like the way the beveled. The way it looked, it was so good. So I'm like, you're you're good. The, yeah. He's he's very good. Yeah, they're they're pretty awesome. Um, I uh, I I need a I really need one of those hammer knives. They're yeah. pretty good. I'm very excited to get. Um, I, I'll do some questions later about the first. Yeah. They just do incredible work. Uh, RD. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. This is something we definitely have an answer for. Is can you guys make it easier to find knives for small makers? They're not super interested in spending money with bigger companies, mm -hmm. um, and it's just not really their style. So yeah, we. I mean, there's the great thing about the world of Japanese knives is there are so many small crafts, mm -hmm. crafts people making knives. Uh, and we're, we're we're trying to we're trying to. Sort of more of them. Now, mm. do you want to speak to that a little bit? The uh, small makers, it's the uh, really hard to define what the small maker is. Say, for example, we have Manaka san in the Saitama region, Miyazaki san in the, uh, this island in uh, Go Fukue island and Goto islands in Nagasaki. Um, so, some like, so as the some other knife makers who do work basically themselves and do pretty much from uh, A to Z. 
Yeah, it's about the small makers. Again. Like that's the uh, that's the really small makers. Then there is a category I think it should be um, featured as well. The for example the um, um, Yoshikatsu Tanaka san, who has two like his son is taking soon to be taking over his business and there's a uh okugami san who is uh working for that company there it's a team of three only making a uh, 30 like a day um they are not the sharpeners they are only the uh, blacksmith so um they do like consistent uh, 30 a day I don't know if you want to consider that as a small maker. I'm not quite sure. But if you're looking for someone like, um, say, Manaka-san, Miyazaki-san, we do have the uh, Sakai-san, who is from the uh, island of Kyushu in the Kumamoto area. He learned all his skills from the uh, Nishida-san, <laughs> Daisuke Nishida-san in that, the same region, and started to do such a fabulous work. Um, Mazaki-san is also, I guess, the small maker as as I briefly talked about. Mm -hmm. Masashi-san, is he a small maker? Not quite sure, but he, again, is the only, um, he mainly forges the knives mm -hmm. and two workers or the apprentices um, producing knives there as well. But yeah. they do pretty much A to Z at that workshop too. Yeah, totally. Right? Well, it's more talk. I mean, they don't make their own handles, but like mm -hmm. everything else is pretty much. But there's, you know, more than one guy. There That's three. Yeah. The, uh, but say if you're looking for someone, uh, knives from someone who's very little, little known, I guess, Sakai san is great. Great, uh, great uh, knives from. And uh, Kyohei Shindo san is also the another. Another guy who now is in Tosa making the knives very like rustic, mm. um, down earth, very inexpensive, yeah, as well. So, yeah, uh, RD, there's I've got a I've got a kind of I can explain a, an issue that that exists with small makers and a couple of solutions that we've come up with. Um, the issue is that they're small makers and they don't make a lot of knives, <laughs> <laughs> and, and as global demand for Japanese knives grows, they you know they become harder to get. Uh, our solution, however, we have a few. Um, we just started to source more makers. Like in the last couple of years, we've oh, yeah. brought on a lot more makers who are that kind of small maker category. Mm -hmm. that, you know, they don't make a ton of knives, or it's just one guy or a couple of guys, but mm -hmm. they're very dedicated to the craft. Because that's what we love. That's what we're all about. Um, so we're, we're we're finding more, which is which is a lot of fun. And our recent trip to Japan was a big mm -hmm. part of that. But then also we've got certain times of year that are focused around small makers because a lot of these makers, what it comes down to is we just can't get enough knives to have year round. And so in August, we have small what we call Small Makers Month, where we focus on kind of educating and sharing the stories about these makers, talking about them, making videos and vlogs about them, uh, and getting their name out there, as well as obviously stocking their knives and bringing them mm -hmm. in. And it's a little bit of a like they show, they show up when they show up, but mm -hmm. it's kind of the time we set it up around. So yeah, we try to like you know set set up the story so that you know like you know who who those people are, mm -hmm. what they do, what they like, those, those kind of stuff. Yeah, you know the person behind the knife that you're getting. Yeah, uh, and then the knife for garage sales can be good for that too because that's a time it's an event where we bring in a lot of new and different and unusual knives, uh, and often from quote unquote new makers and small makers. Um, and so May 9th, uh, sorry, 16th to the 23rd mm -hmm. this year. And then usually there's one in November as well, uh, right at the beginning of the month. Th those are times when we do bring in a lot more of those yeah. kind of small makers. I, I hope that helps. So we'll, we're going to keep, keep at it and keep bringing in more small makers. Yeah. Any questions arise? Oh, we got tons of questions. Awesome. <laughs> um, you got any updates for us? You're just throwing yourself I'm just throwing yourself It's okay. just taking very... You know what, that's fine. We got lots of good well, questions fine. today, so we'll just focus on this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know what? Here's a here's a low ball. Uh, nice easy one. Shubham uh, Chaud Chaudhary. I, I'm very sorry if I mispronounced your name. This says Naoto. How was Japan? It's great. <laughs> the Japan was fantastic. The again, we did go to um, we did meet a lot of different um, existing you know people who tried to reconnect uh, existing. Um, relationships, strength in the existing relationship, as well as the some of the new makers, new people. Um, 
one of one of the film that we were we got really excited about was the uh this uh, Satoshi Nakagawa san from the uh from Sakai he just took over the uh his uh Shiraki Hamono in the name basically he was actually forging it for Ooh. Shiraki san for the longest time oh. and it's just you know the name changed it's like the Anryu Hamono right oh. the, uh, Ikeda san was doing the most of jobs but the the name didn't change, but yeah, yeah. Nakagawa Sun's place. Oh, um, with the uh, very bad reception, we <laughs> tried to do the uh, Instagram live oh. from the uh, from his workshop, but you know, there's a little bit of footage, and yeah. uh, we did actually have very good footage uh, from that w- workshop as well. So stay tuned on that. Uh, besides, we will have a few Nakagawa Sun's knives for uh, this uh, May 16th. Uh, thing. Oh, awesome! Some cool stuff. It's super cool stuff on that day from him. So. Yeah, we uh, <clears throat> we took uh, cameras to Japan and, and now to like filmed a ton of stuff, and so we're gonna have anywhere from like four to eight videos coming out on the YouTube channel, kind of like probably once a month, starting late May, early June. Mm-hmm. We, we just have to sort through all the footage and start editing. But uh, stay tuned because we do have you know profiles on some of the makers. Yeah. Um, some kind of more theme videos talking about like apprenticeships in Japan or, uh, you know, how factory forging works. Um, so there's a lot of different cool stuff. Yeah. Some like interviews yeah. that I have to uh, translate. Yeah. <laughs> Those ones will take a little longer, but uh, yeah. Uh, hopefully once a month for the next, for the rest of the year, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, here's a good one from E30 Birdie. Back to the technical stuff. Actually, real quick. Yeah. I had a question. What was the best part of your trip to Japan? Because you, you know, it's your home country, but you haven't been for a couple of years. Food. I gained quite a bit of weight, as you may be able to see on the camera. You look great. Um, the little tip, I had the shirt. Like, I usually bring a week worth of the clothing, mm. you know, different shirts and stuff. So the shirt that I wore on day three, I did a laundry and wore them on day 13. Right. And I felt a little tight around my uh, belly and chest part. So that's how much uh, I enjoy the food. Yeah. I <laughs> should have got all the beer. And beer. <laughs> well, you're drinking for two, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that was good. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? The real, real good story about the uh, this um, knife wary side mm-hmm. is this um, company food. Is specialized in uh, um, steel making. Mm. No, steel maker, but uh, so that was very. The company who uh, specialize in the uh, they do make scissors as well as the uh, for their purpose they do clad the steel there. Oh, cool! So um, the president of the company has a doctor. <laughs> is a doctor of metallurgy. Right. Dr. Steel. And we I had a mic beside me as well, but um I didn't have time to translate any of what I will be actually talking about. <laughs> I got so excited about knowing lots of stuff. Totally. Um lots of stuff well, that we I the audio we can we can transcribe it and go yeah, 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 yeah. Lots of stuff that I it was kind of foggy how the steel works, how those steels forge wells and stuff, right? How yeah. the, those steels, um, I know how it transforms with the, uh, what you might call it, the, the temperature. Right. But there are some like other stuff that affects, and that was an eye-opening um and such an eye-opening the conversation that I, I had with the uh, with him. So cool, that's, that's really great. Exciting. Okay, back to the sharpening stuff. E thirty birdie, another good question here. Mm-hmm. Naoto, how would you go about thinning a concave grind? Would you thin till it is flat grind, or do it in sessions and keep the low spots till they finally go Con- away? Cav- ca- cave concave grind. Concave. Not the convex. Yeah, so we're kind of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, what what would your straight up approach be? The uh, concave. So, no knife has the um, straight uh, bevel. Well, unless like they try to make them or the machine you set the machine to. Mm-hmm. Ideally, there is a tiny bit of a, you know, curve to it. 
uh, any of that, uh, any of the bevels. Uh, what Masashi-san says is that, like on, on an interview that I did with him, he says, there's no flat side on any of the knives. There's no flat on the bevel. It's, it is straight, but it's tapers mm. and all that stuff. So there is no flatness. Yeah, it's like a flat plane, kind of like twists. No, and, exactly. Yeah. There is a twist and there is the little turns and curves. And only thing that's flat is the, uh, the edge, right? Yeah. All other parts, right. it tapers, it tapers, it torsions. Right, it's like a three-dimensional. Yeah, yeah. Kinda, yeah. So... Um, when I sharpen the uh, convex or the concave um, with a, uh, like very low, big low spots on the blade, um, I guess depends on the purpose, right? The, uh, say, for example, that the stray razors with the uh, full hollow grind. Um, unless you have, I have that the particular tool and I'm skilled enough to do so, I will just put the flat on that mm. uh, Stray razor, right? Yep. Um, concave blade on, say, for example, on this bevel right here, I will put flat on it and sharpen them like this. If I see the concavity, uh, I'll try to see where it's a where the low spot is, and see if I can ignore it or the um, I could just keep going until that the, the low spot's gone. Um, so in a way it's flat, but again, the my how I try to sharpen the blade like this is at the uh, different, slight different angle at the tip and the bevel. So um, maybe flat at the very tip, but maybe a little bit more rolled or it's got a little bit more carve up the uh, heel part. Mm. Hopefully that makes sense. So it's, it's there isn't like s simple, yes, I do flat or I do this way. Um, I wish there is, but uh, even like this, while I'm doing this, I'm trying to make this part lower at the tip, lower part. And as I come up here, I do a bit higher. Um, at the edge sharpening so cool and any particular stones that you would use for the process um make sure you have really good core stone mm. um that is your shaping stone that especially when it comes to more like say advanced sharpening or thinning and such core stone is very important because this is the i would do 90 Five percent job, like making that the uh, bevel look good and everything with the uh, two twenty, the core stone. So that's that's the uh, really important stone to uh, have, uh, or the uh, you know good good two twenty or core stone is very important to have when you are actually doing thinning or repairs. Okay, cool. Uh, Spoon Monkey is asking, what are your thoughts on Jiro knives? Relatively new mm -hmm. things, but uh, already they're you know higher up in the price range. I've I, I've never held one. I know that the, he is a swordsman, and he makes and he's been making very fantastic, fantastic blades these days. Um, uh, the, I've spoken to a person, Japanese person, who has zero knives. And that particular person has quite a bit of knives in Japan. What he was saying is that the um, it's not like razor, but it's got really good thickness behind the uh, behind on, on the spine, mm. and it's got nice tall bevel too. So it will probably be work really really good. Um, I'm only seen uh, on the pictures, so I can't really right. spoke spoken to it, but the uh, Seems like he does really great job um, making the kitchen knives, like from the look of it. Mm. Gotcha. Okay, cool. <laughs> when you were talking about uh, making those little micro cuts on the abalone. Yeah. Uh, uh, Marcus said, uh, got me thinking about putting a vibrating plate under the cutting board. <laughs> micro cuts. You, you know, I'll take it one step further. Just get, we should make knives that have a vibrating handle. 
Yeah. Like, like an electric toothbrush. And then you just <laughs> <laughs> make those tiny little shakes for it. <laughs> um, no, we're never going to do that. No. <laughs> we're not Gillette. Um, yeah, well, just me. Yeah. Sonic. <laughs> Sonic yeah. Care. Ah, Sonic Knives. Yeah. yeah. I'm into that. Um, okay. Here's a, a great one from uh, Shubham. When do you feel a blade begins to need thinning? Would you thin the entire blade or only go up to a few centimeters from the edge? Hmm. That is the uh, good question. Um, when, so there are a few ways you can do. Thinning, say when you have the knife with the uh, this primary bevel, like even uh, the gutos and stuff like that, I try to do the whole bevel. It's just to keep the look the same and stuff. Yeah. Um, but if you have the knife that is like a, a Tojuro DP and it does have the very just even grind from the mm -hmm. spine to the tip. Not the obvious bevel. I sometimes do the, uh, so I want to call that partial, but yes, like a centimeter or two thinning. Mm. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So it really depends also when the uh, when the concavity is really, really bad. I right. do a partial or just a, a centimeter or the five, mm. less than a centimeter thinning just at the edge as well. Okay, concavity or convexity? Concavity. Okay. So okay. when it's like, when it's really bad, yeah. that I know it needs long, oh, it needs yeah. Uh, so I do a little bit here. Mm. And and as the when it comes back, I was try to see the the condition of it. Yeah. Then decide whether I yeah. Okay. Cool. Play the long game. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we did. If you want to learn more about that, Shivam, if you go to the um, Delta's Nerdy Power Hour playlist, we did an episode on thinning knives that don't have a primary bevel. I think last year the quality might not be quite as good, but uh, there's definitely some good techniques in there. Worth, worth going back to watch. Um, uh, where are we? Got any uh, updates there, Delta? Are we doing good? Doing good. It's starting to. I don't know if the, this camera is good enough to catch some of the uh, spots. There's still some spots here and here that needs a uh, needs a little bit more work. Mm -hmm. Whole bevel starting to become about the same thickness because I was fixing the tip first, right? I there was a chip, right? Mm -hmm. So I did fix the uh, tip at the higher angle. So I made that tip part a lot thicker than the heel part. So I didn't. I basically kept working on the tip part more than the all other section of the knife, mm. right? Because ultimately, I want to have this thickness of the knife pretty much same all the way up here. I right. still feel the little thickness from here and up, it gets a little bit thicker, so I will keep going. Because you're not down with the thickness? No. Okay. I, I ch chose... I chose terrible knife to uh, show at the video, but hey, it's okay. We it's, got it's a real, it's a real, right? Right. Um, yeah, sometimes you just have to sit there for two hours grinding the same knife. That's just how it goes. Um, uh, Powell L is looking at getting uh, Sky Kikumori, Tomoshibi, Deba, and Yanagi. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Awesome, awesome knives. Uh, I know the man that I know that the man who worked with you created it. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me more about these knives at all? Yeah. The, uh, so, apparently, I'm not supposed to say his name, mm. but <laughs> he he is the, um, he's the, um, so there's the uh, the young um, blacksmith and the sharpener, um, whatchamacallit, the uh, <laughs> unit, <laughs> I guess. Mm. Um, team. In a, in a, yeah, a duo. And in, in a Sakai, uh, Tosa area right um one tetsu is as a uh, blacksmith mm -hmm. jin as a sharpener 
Uh, and apparently Jin's name can be exposed. So Jin or the sharpener's name is Naohito Myojin. Um, right. Same actually character as my name, Naoto. Oh. Naohito Myojin uh, is a uh, son of the this Myojin Riki, the company in uh, Tosa. And he worked at quite a few different places in, uh, in Sakai as well as the uh, um, Echizen area and polished his uh, sharpening skill. Mm. His partner, the uh, Tetsu, uh, he actually used to work for us at Knifeware. Um, he, um, I actually, my first knife I purchased from him. The, uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, yeah, because yeah, he's working at Knifeware. Yeah. And yeah, he used to work at, with the, uh, and he went back home and he started uh, a work for this, uh, Kato-san, mm -hmm. the uh, Kato-san, uh, Hiroshi Kato-san. Yeah, right, older Kato. And he then moved to the uh, this um, work for uh, Shimizu-san, the, the guy who uh, makes single bevel knives. So he's very talented. He now can forge double bevel and single bevel mm -hmm. very comfortably. That's awesome. So the that the uh, Kikumori Tomoshibi line <clears throat> is their single bevel lines. Right. It's really well made and great fit and finish. Yeah. E relatively easy to sharpen compared to some other single bevel knives. Easier to maintain and it'll be a it'll be great knife for those who's never had the. Uh, the uh, single bevel knives. Yeah, because they're a very like agreeable price. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Hope that helps. Um, E30 Birdie was just following up on the thinning out the Kamo. Uh, uh, Shiro Kamo said, uh, of course, the stone is the Imanishi Arato 220. Arato Kun? Yeah. yeah so. Arato is great. The, um, we did have them before. Make sure that um, to, uh, uh, sorry. Make sure to uh, chew them because the, I found that Aratokun is slightly softer mm -hmm. than the, uh, say, this guy here, the 220. Although Aratokun is big, right? So it's pretty good. That's the one I have at home, but it's <laughs> hasn't been flat since I bought it. Right. Uh, Aratokun is very, it's it, it's easy to um, go out of shape, I guess, like, yeah. you know, like drinking too much beer. Uh, <laughs> Knife or 220 stone. Is the a uh, little bit hotter, but it's not a Arotokun usually is thicker, so yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, Grant, Grant Hendrick just popped in, just said, Howdy, Nathan and Alto. I look forward to watching this later. Back to work. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank Grant. you. Hope you enjoy the show in the future. Um, Spoon Monkey. Oh, here's a great this or that question Hado Sumi Bunga, uh, Bunga or Kurosaki Senko Bunga. Guess you know different steels, right? Yeah. The uh, the uh, Kurosaki Senko is R two. The uh, Hado Sumi is the white number two. Right. Um, Very different looking guys too. Yeah. I'm just gonna say Hado Sumi for me. I I would have to agree. The it's got a little bit more character to it, and I think overall, like. Those of you who's watching this may be interested in Hado Sumi than the uh, Kurosaki as the sharpening job is slightly more more fun. Like when it, when it comes yeah, to resharpening, nice. yeah, when it comes to sharpening uh, Hado Sumi, it'll be it'll be a little bit more fun. Well, it's got that really nice polish on the spine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too, right? Yeah, it's a, a very nice knife. Okay, so just some clarification here about thinning knives from yep. E30 Birdie, because that's, that's, that's one of the main topics for today. So, Nato, do you always do a thinning on the whole Kireha and then you sharpen and put a micro bevel mm -hmm. on the end, or do you zero grind when sharpening? I have no idea what that means to you, honestly. I don't know what the zero grind is. I, I try to do the, uh, the, the uh, previous, like you uh, try to do whole bevel, mm. then put the um, Koba on them. Yeah. 
Oh, that you know, they just clarified just before I asked that question. Yeah, yeah. Did I think I worded my question weird? No, I just don't speak uh, that clear, really. Um, kind of wondering if one should always sharpen Kireha as a whole or just the micro bevel at times. Like, do you mm. do you always sharpen? Oh, okay. So I think I think I've heard this term used online. Uh, the zero grind is like you just sharpen the Kireha and that's it. Oh no, I would never do that. The uh, that's 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 um that's very Japanese a uh, a professional chef way of sharpening it, and it has been um not approved, but it's not the greatest. Like I've spoken to sharpeners. I haven't. I don't really speak to the uh, those um, chefs. Like Japanese chefs like to do that. It the um, in Japanese, it's called betatogi. Mm. So wh what it is, is that, if, for example, this yanagiba, they just do this sharpening until you raise the enough bar. Mm -hmm. And what they do is put the flat and do that. Okay. One of the reasons why they, the Japanese chefs like to do is the uh, they feel it's the sharpest edge. Um, right. And it may be true. Disadvantage is that the uh, it makes the edge way too brittle, way too mm. brittle for the any jobs that you do with the kitchen knives. The uh, I've done it once. I've I had a 210 millimeter usuba, and the first thing I did and is that I did beta togi mm -hmm. and took all the micro bevels out. Mm -hmm. It was sharp as as hell. And it cuts into the cutting board really, really good, and chips it so easy. Uh, I chipped the tip like, like five or six times. Yeah, um, such such a thin like filament steel. If you look how what the angle of this is, it's like the Masasan did actually have the little data on the bevel angle. It is five degrees. If you're just sharpening a five degrees from both ends. It makes it way too thin. Mm -hmm. And when you're cutting into the cutting board, because it's like so thin, it digs into the cutting board too deep. What the koba does, so for those of you who really believe the, um, the betatogi or whatever zero grind is, um, that is more like, um, like say you have the uh, jeans and you cut it and leave it and you start to see the flay. Right. That's what it is. Okay. And you do a little, you know, this type of uh, stitching. Yeah. That's the koba. Uh, okay. It's a good analogy. I like that. So, I do always, always put the koba. Koba angle koba. can change. Koba angle can be eight degrees, um, or the, you know, fifteen, ten degrees can. I'll probably if I put the eight degree koba. I would put another so called. So there's Koba and Ito. Like a micro micro bevel. Yeah. Very light one. Yeah, a couple of strokes. Yeah. Cool. So, and any sharpeners I've spoken to, they do not agree on the beta togi. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you want to try it, try it out. But yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very thin. Um, Marcus uh, has an interesting uh, approach on learning knife skills. Uh, they learned so the best knife training they've ever had was learning to fillet all types of fish with a tiny cleaver. <laughs> they mastered that, and then learning how to use more specialized knives became a lot easier. Is your name Colin? <laughs> I'm joking. And uh, they're sharpening their vintage cleaver along with you right now. Cool. Yeah, that that would definitely. I mean, I, mean I, that, I learned to do almost all stuff in the kitchen with a two forty Uto, so it's not totally different. Like when I went to cooking school, they're like, "You should just do everything with a right ten or twelve inch chef knife," which isn't always the best way. But if you're learning how to like handle knife confidently, that'll certainly get you there fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. Okay. Jamal had another question about knife line. Uh, what are your thoughts? What are your experience or thoughts on the Masamoto KS? Uh, just got the old man Han Kasumi mm -hmm. Yo Yokuhaku Ko. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for it to arrive. 
I Masamoto, right? And yep. Gyokuhaku. Um <laughs> so the is it Usuda? Uh Hong Sumi uh Ko. Uh, any shape or no. okay? Oh, I, I the the method afterwards said, or the question afterwards said, I chose the two forty millimeter. Okay, so you that may be the Kyoto. The um, so KS line is when it's Gyokuhaku and a Kasumi, it's not KS. KS is this like very thin piece, one steel, uh, Masamoto line. They're pretty nice and thin. Um, they say it's hand forged, but uh, I doubt it. It's actually machine forged, but it's nice and thin. And it's going to cut very, very nice. Um, it is the uh, one of the high carbon steel, so it can patina it very, very nicely. Um, for some reason, they leave the big space between the handle and the machi. So, like for some reason, it's pretty big. Oh, I really want um, machi. If you're looking for a uh, some like single bevels from Masamoto, single bevel no, Masamotos are actually made in Sakai. Oh. Sakai. I've seen those blades that's kicking around with Masamoto engraving on them. <laughs> Interesting. Like some places that we visited, yeah, it's got Masamoto on it. Yeah. Right. I know who makes Aritsugu knives too. They put right. Aritsugu on it. But they're great. <laughs> they're great. Um, it's just really, it's how it's been. The uh, Masamoto, Aritsugu, Sugimoto, all those companies are not manufacturers, they are retail stores. Or the there are like brands, yeah. So they put their name on all the knives that they carry. Mm, gotcha. um, but they, they're pretty reliable. They're pretty good. They know their things. Yeah. Sure. Um, <clears throat> e thirty birdie just had a follow up to that talk about the zero grind, the micro bevels, and all that. Mm -hmm. they, no one agrees that the micro bevel adds strength to the edge. Um, but we're just wondering, would you, I guess the final point is like, would you slightly thin your knife every time you sharpen it? Or would you sharpen mm. it every time you like this? The, again, that's the, I, I don't have the uh, clear yes or no answer. Some knives I do thin them. Yeah. Um, and some knives I don't. Um, for example, the, uh, when the knife, say like my, uh, Masashi Kuroshu. Yeah. I have them for about five years. I don't use them every day, but I, you know, because I can rotate through, I only sharpen them like twice. That was only the touch up on the uh, um, mm. uh, micro bevel. Yeah. And it still keeps its thickness, like very thin. Nice. Yeah, it can depend on the knife. Like if it comes really thin from the yeah, micro. Yeah, and... I think how dull it is, too. Like, yeah. if it's dull, dull, I'll thin my knife yeah, up. Yeah. But, like, I tuned up my Denko recently, and I just did the micro metal because it yeah. was still pretty sharp. So, yeah, fortunately, there is no, like, clear yes or no answer. Yeah. Um, like, say, for example, my Fujiwara Nashiji, I do thin them, actually, mm. every time because that the primary bevel... It's got a little bit, a little bit more shorter uh, blade, or that the uh, bevel, mm -hmm. and it's got a little bit more stronger uh, convexity. So I try to thin them so that it doesn't get really thick at one point. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I guess it depends on how big of the con concavity, convexity, and how tall the bevels are, and all that stuff. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah. I. Most of the time, I would I would just thin the knife out every time. Personally, like because it, you might just end up making more work for yourself down the road. Mm. And if it seems like you're going to need to thin it out, I would probably just thin it out, um, just so that you're not creating that like you know really exhausting amount of work. For yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Cool. Well, if anybody else has more questions, that that brings us to the end of the of the kind of questions. Um, you know, we kind of caught, covered some restoration stuff today, um, mostly talking about knife thinning, which, yeah. you know, is a big part of it, especially if your knife is, is chipped or dull or rusty or yeah. anything like that. But if you have any questions about, you know, upcoming um, event. Yeah, totally. We have, um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll go through the housekeeping while we see if there's any more questions. Um, 
the night from garage sale is kind of the big big bit of news here uh it is coming up uh in may from the 16th to the 23rd the garage sale is an event that historically takes place after we go to japan and we shop a whole bunch of visit all these different makers and we bring back a bunch of different cool stuff and so you can expect uh new knife lines one of a kind stuff some rare knives some prototypes perhaps Rare knives. Uh, rare yeah. knives. Lots of rare knives this time, it sounds like. Have you ever heard of Aogami Super Honyaki? Aogami Super Honyaki. Oh, my God. Aogami Super Honyaki. I love that. <laughs> Aogami Super Honyaki. I, I hope that sells out really quick because I'll buy that. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a really exciting time. It's also a good time if you just like a deal. Like We usually have some refurbished stuff. It's kind of scratch and dent. We have uh, some smoking deals every year, so... Definitely check that out. It'll be online at starting at 8 a.m. and running all week. Start at 10 a.m. local time. We've got a bunch of live streams kind of based around that. Uh, speaking of which, we'll have uh, next week is Japanese Knife 101. Uh, I think we'll probably talk a bit about the trip to Japan, eh? Am I doing it? Well, Mike is doing it? Well, we haven't planned it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but we are talking about the uh, garage sale uh, next, next week. So... Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you guys have questions about now, more questions about Nato's trip to Japan, or uh, or you want to, you know, kind of get some hints uh, as to the the knife or garage sale. Yoshikazu Ikeda. <laughs> oh, I don't even know what that means. Satoshi Nakagawa. Oh yeah. No Hitomiyojin and Tetsujin. <laughs> yeah, so tune in next week. That'll be, <laughs> that'll be Tuesday at one p.m. Uh, and then. Uh, Shoichi Hashimoto. Shoichi Hashimoto. Ooh, what are we getting for them? <laughs> I like I like that whispering. Hope hope people hear. <laughs> it's awesome. It's very atmospheric. <laughs> um, and then the following week, night for uh, Sharp Knives Rock is on May 9th, 3 p.m. Mountain Time. That's a Monday. We're giving away two knives. We're giving away a prototype from Masashi-san's new line, uh, and we're also giving away a Seki Tetsugu new knife. Have to go, yeah. Have to go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so tune in for a chance to win one of two very awesome knives, as well as, you know, cross sale previews. We're going to show some uh, behind the scenes from the blacksmith shops and some of the video that we shot in, in Japan. So uh, it should be a pretty exciting episode. Yeah. Uh, we got a question about how you enter that giveaway. So tune in uh, May 9th at 3 p.m. Mountain Time or watch the episode afterwards. You'll have all week to enter. Basically, watch the episode. There will be a few questions at the end of the episode. You send, you email the answer to tv at night and then uh, and then we'll draw the winners on the morning of the garage sale at like 7.30 in the morning. And we'll announce those live. Yeah, so that's exciting. Um, any other news? Nato, you got any news? Again, the um, no, that announcement was covered pretty much. Yeah. Good. We just came back from Japan, for those of you who missed the first part. Yeah. Just came back from Japan, um, learned a whole bunch of stuff, mm -hmm. and we are so excited to share with all of you the... Um, Takes a little while to get you know everything you know set up and write up write up and do translation and everything, but the, we're pretty excited. How much things we learned about knives, steel sharpening, and everything. Yeah. yeah. So there'll be some pretty cool stuff. So stay tuned. Well, we should have a, a video a month on the YouTube channel starting next month. Ooh. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we also have well Mother's Day is coming up pretty soon. Don't just that's just a general reminder, courtesy call. Uh, it's I believe it's uh, Sunday, May 9th or May 8th. So get your mom something. Oh, yeah, I have to think of something, <laughs> right? Um, and then we're actually, if you're in Calgary, Alberta, we're making a beer with uh, Highline Brewing in Calgary. Um, it's it's a collaboration between us, Highline Brewing, and uh, ABCBs, which is a local. Um, company that promotes sustainable urban beekeeping and so we're going to be brewing a really delicious uh cream ale honey honey cream ale should be really good we're doing a launch party for that on may 29th i believe sunday at about noon 
Uh, so you check that out. We might also send a couple dozen cans to the stores. And so if, if you come by the store in, in early June, they might be able to get a mm-hmm. can of beer. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's what I have for now. Yeah, the yeah. um, we're working towards well, working on bringing Masai Sun in Canada soon, as well. right? Um, yeah, haven't decided the date yet, but early August, probably early August is something, yeah. So it seems like it seems like that's the yeah, yeah. So, um, keep an eye out. The uh, when he's here, it most likely a uh, full. Uh, tour, <laughs> Canadian mm-hmm. tour. Mm-hmm. So if you're going to come say hi to him, you know, we'll pr- most likely go to Vancouver, mm-hmm. Alberta, Calgary, and Edmonton, and Ottawa, and maybe Toronto. Mm-hmm. Maybe. And we're hoping he might be able to like engrave a few down the people yeah. in store. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Uh, well, filigree. Oh, and one other thing I was going to mention. Speaking of Toronto, is uh, we do have a couple, at least one pop up plan for the summer. Oh, nice. Uh, we're still finalizing dates. We're hoping to be there in June with the Ottawa team. Um, we're hoping that we can do June and August so that we can do our Masashi Sun. So if you're in Toronto, stay tuned. August pop up. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, we've got a few more questions here. For me in the episode. Uh, well, Filigree Aquatics just says, I bought the fun wife of Takamura 170 uh, Sentoku for a birthday. Mm. Fingers crossed she likes it. Uh, no, you're going to love it. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, that knife is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. And that's a perfect knife for just like, you know, the average home cook. Like my my spouse has a similar size, like 170 stainless steel Sentoku. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. is my use? Uh, we have 175. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, like the best night to get your, your partner. Um, okay, Siobhan says, which steel is the most enjoyable for you to sharpen now, Um, White number two carbon steel. The uh, It's easier to be uh, ground. It's, um, it's very honest uh, steel to what I do, and they, the feedback is very honest. So. Mm. Cool. Awesome. Yes. Um, Daddy Knows Best is asking, do you, have Japanese chefs ever tried oil stone to have an opinion on them? Or for that matter, Japanese knife sharpeners? Uh, I know it's kind of the opposite of what water stones are. Uh, they have a hard Arkansas stone mm-hmm. just for touching up chisels, basically. Um, I don't think they have that much of a huge opinion about it because the um, it basically does the very same thing, right? The, it, the abrasive... Uh, particles inside will grind the steel off. Mm-hmm. Um, Arkansas steel uh, sharpening stones are pretty, yeah, like popular. A little bit of coarser, a mid grit. Um, so it's it's good for that kind of uh, grits. Um, I'm sure like Arkansas stones can be used with the water too, if you have a plenty plenty yeah, enough water. I think. I think that'd be, that'd be an interesting experiment. Yeah. Uh, E30 Birdie says, can we just get uh, Kevin to open knife work here in Germany so I can come take class all the time become a pro like that? Mm. Maybe one day. Mm. We uh, we have more plans within Canada before that, but but you never know. And or, Japan, or maybe. Visit us in Canada. Yeah. yeah. Maybe so, maybe Japan. Nice place to visit. We have lots of German tourists that come through Calgary here. Yeah, hopefully the, all the international travels we resumes pretty soon and mm-hmm. you know makes it make make it easier to go other countries the mm-hmm. i i was i was lucky right being uh, being japanese it was a little bit easier to uh you know visit japan and travel around yeah and being able to you know read and speak all that kind of stuff that's totally. made it a little bit easier too totally. uh brian Brian Krennic or Krenzik, uh, I hope I said your name right. Did Nato get to try out Masashi San's new knives? Uh, the new two new lines that we have coming out, uh, including the knife he showed during the live interview. And if so, how did you like them, and when will they be stocked? I love both of them. We <laughs> did have the uh, some uh, <laughs> prototype before uh, came in. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's great. And again, he did. He didn't like he always does like try um attempt to improve the uh, the way he forges he treats and everything a uh, great thing about 
him again is that also he does um, research. Like he sends off the product to the researching labs and, you know, yeah. hardness testing and stuff. It's like, yeah. yeah, you said he's get, heat treating it and getting it up to like 63, 64, eh? 64 for BS1. Wow. 63 for uh, SLD. Right. And most like for those people who's not really familiar with those numbers, you, not many knife makers try, like try to bring it to that. Well, they can't really. SLD usually sits around 61 range. The way he forges and the heat treats and some secret way of he cold forges, uh, he can, and also the heat treatment and everything makes it the steel a little bit hotter than the uh, what the paper says. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm excited to get them. Um, we're not sure exactly when they're going to come in, but uh, keep an eye on field. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty soon here, next couple of months. Yeah. Um. Hey, just a couple more questions. Uh, Daddy Knows Best is asking, do you think the Japanese knife makers will try even more super steels like S90B or Rex 45? I think the um, I think I've spoken to some of the uh, steel makers and uh, blacksmith. Um, some traditionalists, they probably won't. Uh, especially people in Sakai region, they're a little bit more traditionalist. Uh, they have to be really convinced to try new things. Um, some guys in like people who does by themselves, they sometimes use those uh, super steels. Although some American steels, they apparently they don't have much access to them. Mm, they they're tough to get. Or yeah, yeah, it's tough to get. Mm. I've I've spoken to actually like and asked like, hey. Would you actually be able to get the S thirty V and stuff like that? And they're yeah. like, no. Well, and also, you know, just even the pure matter of price, like mm -hmm. getting steel shipped from within Japan as opposed to getting steel shipped across the ocean. Yeah, and also maybe like some protectionist type of uh, policy happening oh, too, right? Yeah, because you know, weird trade politics. Or yeah, yeah. 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 Hey. Interesting. Uh, okay, just a few more here. Yeah. Um, Powell L is asking, is Takumi Ikeda mm -hmm. uh, creating something interesting now? Uh, I have Nakiri from Andrew, and I wonder if the young blacksmith is going to maintain the tradition or kind of take it in his own direction. He, uh, I haven't I haven't finished the, the translation yet, the <laughs> interview. It is already uh, on YouTube for us to view. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what you do. Ago, yeah, uh, what, what, a little, a little bit more ago. You, you a month and a half. You've been really busy. Um, what he's trying to do is maintain the, definitely the tradition that the Anrus, the family has been forging for like uh, fourth generation, five generations. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, though, he is uh, trying something new. For example, the the way in which that all the tanks were uh, forged is quite a bit different. From the how the edges and knives are traditionally forged. Oh, interesting. So, um, so he's definitely trying his own stuff. Yeah. yeah. And I've seen his uh, Chromax line came in, and like some some of the new were type of steel as well. So. Oh, cool. That's awesome. We're excited. Yeah. E30 Birdie is definitely thinking about coming to visit Canada at some point. That's awesome. The last one is just uh, Shimon is asking who loves Sriracha the most in the shop. That bottle says someone can't get enough. Is that, is that your Sriracha bottle there? Oh. I can't remember. Not me. I don't use that much with Sriracha. Yeah. I bet I bet the folks in the Calgary shop use a yeah, lot yeah, of pizza. Yeah. They eat a lot of pizza. Yeah. We found that she's Sriracha... A vending machine in Japan. Oh, yeah, take awesome. picture. <laughs> I I use a good amount, but I I mix up my hot sauces, so right, I, I right. use a whole bunch of different ones. Okay, well, thanks. All right, for thanks for yeah. Today. Any other closing thoughts before we go now, Tom? Good. No, just keep an eye peeled for what's actually coming on the uh, the um, May sixteenth, the first date. There's there will be a preview, and it will. Yeah talk about it and everything yeah. so it'll be a really cool stuff we got lots of previews like i said japanese knife 101 we'll probably just do a couple sneak peeks next week talk about not just trip to japan uh the following week uh we got two live videos monday may 9th we've got 
Sharp Knives Rock, the Garage Sale episode. Uh, lots of behind the scenes footage from the Blacksmith Shop, so it's going to be a really cool episode. And we'll have some sneak peeks then. Uh, <clears throat> but also on the Friday of the Garage Sale, Friday the 13th, super lucky day, uh, at 2 p.m. Mountain Time, we'll be live again with more of a proper preview. Now, Tony and Kevin will be unpacking the Garage Sale and kind of setting it up so they'll go through a whole bunch of the knives kind of one by one. They'll answer a handful of questions, but it'll mostly be uh, just a preview, show and tell. And then, of course, we'll be live on the Monday morning. So if you do have questions about specific knives, that's not the time to ask them. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Awesome. Keep an eye out for this uh, this knife being on the uh, uh, refurbished section as well. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have lots of scratch and dead stuff that will go up yeah. just before the sale starts. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Have a good week.